Good morning, and let me welcome you to the Crossings Church on this Sunday morning. If you're visiting with us, again, we are really thrilled that you're here. And we are thrilled because we believe God is doing something at the crossings. He is bringing people together to bless them, but not just to bless them. Because, you know, uh, quite frankly, if, if all we think about is us, we're really not very much like just the selfish world. But he does want to bless us, but he wants to bless us so that we can bless others. And he wants to bless us not in this life, but eternal life. And the Crossings Church is about that. It's about finding blessing in this life as we learn how to have relationships, as we learn how to be moms and dads and brothers and sisters. But it's even more focused ultimately on the life, part of life that matters, and that's the unseen part, the eternal part. That someday there'll be some reunion in heaven. You know, eternity will come into place and we'll have a Crossings reunion and it's my prayer that, you know, all of us will make it there and then we'll look and go, man, who are all these people? And it'll be the people that God has reached through the crossings after all of us are gone. That they never, that we never lose that focus, but we allow God to work on our lives. And what I'm excited about is that every one of us were brought here today with that in mind. Whether you believe that or not doesn't change the reality of what the Scripture teach. That God arranged the time and places so you could have that opportunity. And I'm excited about that opportunity for you, for me, and for this church in general. Inside of your worship bulletin, there's a set of notes that you can pull out and follow along with. Uh, we started a new series a few weeks ago called Under Armour. Uh, it's a very popular apparel brand. It's performance apparel, but long before the companies decided to exploit that for riches, God understood that we needed to have a very special kind of performance apparel. And in Ephesians chapter 6, the apostle Paul gives a list of the kind of garments, the apparel that we are supposed to wear. It's commonly known as the armor of God. And so we're going to read that. Uh, it's not on your notes this week because there wasn't room, which means I've really got to hurry. But in Ephesians chapter 6, this week we are talking about putting on the breastplate of righteousness. But you can follow along as I read. We're in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Paul said this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if the day of evil comes, but when the day of evil comes, you'll maybe be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You see, the Apostle Paul, as we've said in previous weeks, was in jail as he's writing this letter. In a Roman prison, he had been led there by Roman guards wearing Roman apparel, the outfit uh, that they would wear. There's a quite a, a great possibility there were two, at least one Roman guard, possibly two standing outside, and maybe even, as we know, in some times, one was chained to him. And so he's in the middle of what you and I would see as a very bad time, and it would look like he's really losing the battle, but some of the amazing things that happen, and, and it's really amazing to me that some of his best writings that God used him to write and inspired him to write happened in the middle of all of this turmoil. So he's in prison. It wouldn't seem like there's a lot he could do, but he looks up and he sees this Roman guard and he begins to think about the battle and each piece that the Roman soldier wore that was designed to protect him in wartime. And God began to work in his mind and work through him. And as he began to think about what he would write and what God would have him write and what God inspired him to write to the church at Ephesus, but to every one of us today, we get to benefit from that. We said last week as we start this, it starts with the buckle of truth, uh, the belt of truth wearing that, and the next thing is the breastplate of righteousness. And the breastplate of righteousness was designed, it was a metal sheath that would go over the chest of the Roman soldiers. Some of them were custom fit so that they would fit exactly. And on the outside, there was a thick layer of metal that would prevent any arrow, spears, or sword slashes from penetrating. On the inside, there was a leather uh, uh, undergarment there, undercoating, that would make it more uh, comfortable to wear. The, 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 the uh, breastplate of righteousness sat and was connected to the belt of truth. And it's important for us to understand that you can't use one part of the armor effectively without all the others. 
And without the belt, uh, the, the belt of truth, the breastplate would shift. And it was designed, the breastplate was designed to protect the vital organ, organs. Number one, probably the first ones you'd think about are, uh, are the heart and the lungs. Without the breastplate, the Roman soldier became instantly and extremely vulnerable. You see, in that day, arrows and spears and swords were the primary, and daggers were the primary means of fighting. So if, a, if the breastplate was not in, pra, in place, they would lose even before they got on the scene. If it shifted, they were vulnerable. And they were vulnerable again instantly because as soon as it moved, there was an opportunity. And they were vulnerable extremely because the heart and the lungs were vital organs that would be destroyed and the battle would be over. For you and I on a more spiritual level, he's saying you need to know that if you don't have this breastplate in place, if you don't have that belt buckled first and you don't have this breastplate in place, first of all, you're instantly, in an instant, Satan can attack and do something that can destroy your walk with God. But it's not just instantaneous. It's extreme because literal, the literal translation of breastplate is heart protector. You know, for if you were in baseball, played baseball, and you were a catcher, you know what it is to wear the chest protector that a, that a catcher wears, and it's padded. But it's designed to protect your chest and your vital organs from, from the baseball. But the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, literally protected your heart. And so the imagery that the Roman soldier had was that if you moves, if you're instantly vulnerable, but you're extremely vulnerable, that a death blow can be dealt to your relationship with God and your walk with him unless you're wearing this, unless you're putting it on to begin with, but also putting it on in connection with the belt of truth. Now again, the soldier of Christ is like the Roman soldier, and that is you cannot win without the breastplate. But in the breastplate for the spiritual believers, for you and I, it's the breastplate of righteousness in Scripture. The soldier of Christ cannot win a battle without righteousness. If you do not have righteousness in Scripture, then you're opposed. You're not even fighting on God's side. God is fighting against you. Righteousness, if you want a real simple definition, what is it? Righteousness is the requirement for you to have a relationship with God. Without righteousness, you cannot have a right relationship with God. Right and right righteousness. They come from, from the same basic words. If you read through Scripture, you will find that those who are lost eternally will die, not because they were imperfect, but they will die because they were unrighteous. If you read in Scripture and find those that are saved, you're going to find that they don't, they're not saved because they were perfect or they were sinless. You will find out that they were saved because they had been made righteous. And so no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, whether you think you're really good or you think you're really bad, the key to you being saved is having righteousness, to having a right relationship with God. And without it, you can't win the battle eternally. And quite frankly, it's really hard to win the battle in this world. If you're married, you know how hard it is to have a good marriage. And if you don't have the righteousness that comes from God, if you don't know what's really right and the opposite of righteousness, quite simply, is wrongness, if, you don't, if you're using the wrong standards and you're living in a way that's wrong, it's impossible for you to have right relationships with anybody. Ultimately, you'll find them falling apart. So let's jump into it and start by looking at the word righteous and how it's used in Scripture. And this, again, is a very important distinction because sometimes... We'll read scripture and we'll read a word and go, hold it, that's what that means. But over here it says something different and there can be a seeming contradiction. And the word righteous is used in two different ways within scripture. But, but they're not a contradiction, quite frankly, they're complementary. Last week we said that the belt of truth is a weave of a personal relationship with the truth, Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. And because we have a relationship where we love him, we naturally look to his authoritative word. We have an affectionate relationship with the being Jesus because of that. When he speaks, we love him and we know who he is. So when we read the scriptures, we know I'm not looking for my truth or your truth. I'm looking for the truth. What does he say? And whatever he says is true. And then we said because when we find that we don't fake it, we decide to really be truthful with who we are and apply it down deep. And we said that that weave of those three applications of truth make that belt strong enough to hold all of the armor of God. When it comes to the shield 
or, or the breastplate of righteousness, there's an amalgam of two kinds of righteousness that I believe that Paul's referring to in Ephesians 5. And I believe that because what he teaches in other places, especially in the book of Ephesians. But the first way that the word righteous is used, it is used to describe a status attained by grace through faith. It's a status that we have attained. It's, a, it, it's where we are in, in our lives, but it's a status that we have achieved first and foremost, not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. In Romans 3.10, the Bible says there's no one righteous, no, not one. So if you read that on a surface, and that, you, know, you go, there's no one righteous, not one, and yet you have to be righteous, how in the world then do we, do we, are we ever going to be saved? We well, see what Paul knows and what Christ knows is that none of us are ever going to live in a way that is right all the time. Correct? I mean, you may think you're right, right a lot of times, but unless you live at the upper, uh, uh, upper echelon of arrogance, you'll go, yeah, I'm wrong sometimes. And so you have wrong behaviors, you have wrong thoughts, you have wrong actions, you have wrong reactions, and at your very best, that's a reality. And because of that, then you can't be righteous before the eyes of God unless God makes you that way by forgiving you. So Paul, as he writes, he understands that I can't be righteous without Christ's help. I can't, I can't do the right thing. I can't have God look at me as righteous without Jesus help. So in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, he wrote these words. He said, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, for whose sake I've lost all things. So again, he's in a situation where he's lost all things. He's lost his freedom. He's lost his respect, all of those things. But he said, everything that I've lost, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness that comes from the law. Because he knows, and he has wrote before, that no one can be justified, made righteous by the law. So he says, I've come to, 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 I want to I be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. He says, here's what you need to know. The righteousness I'm striving for is not, I, I know I can't ever be perfect, but I can't have God look at me as perfect because of his grace in my life and my faith. And so whenever Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, he died to make you right with him. He died so that whenever he sees you, he doesn't see somebody that's flawed, but he sees only a forgiven person that the son has said, no, I have forgiven him all of those sins, so he is righteous in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, the Bible says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The same thing that makes me a son of God, the same thing that makes me a child of God is the same thing that makes God look at me and go, you're righteous. You are right with me altogether. Not because I am perfect, but because when Jesus died on the cross, I was absolutely forgiven. You see, there's this, this week as I was preparing the lesson, and I, I read a, a, a little uh, article that Ann Graham wrote years ago. And then every Sunday we take of the Lord's Supper because we always want to remember, first and foremost, that everything that good that happened in our life doesn't happen because of our response. Now understand that response is essential, but it doesn't happen because of that. It happens because of the actions of God. If Jesus had not died on the cross, if he had not came to show us how to live, but also to forgive us for not living that way, we would have never, no matter how hard we would have tried to respond in the right way, it would have never resulted in our being righteous before God in a way that would allow him to save us. Anne Graham wrote these words. She reads from Mark 15 to begin in verse 24, where the Bible says, and when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. She said the Romans, as most oppressors, stripped their captives of anything and everything that could, poss could, have, uh, could possibly have any value at all. To the victor or captors go the spoils. She goes on to explain when Jesus finally arrived at the place of execution around 9 o'clock in the morning, 
If his treatment followed standard procedure in those days, he was stripped of all of his clothing with a the possibility they may have allowed him, allowed him to retain a loincloth. Yet because Jesus was stripped naked, you and I could be clothed. The Bible tells us that all of our righteousness, including the very best things we could ever do, are so permeated with sin and selfishness that they're like filthy rags in God's sight. Isaiah 64, 4, 6, I'm sorry. But at the cross, Jesus gave us his perfect, spotless robe of righteousness and took our filthy garments of sin in exchange. On Judgment Day, Anne says, you and I will be dressed in his righteousness before God because he wore the filthy garments of our sin. We will be clothed because he was stripped. In this great clothing exchange, the victor does not get the spoils. The captor does not get the spoils. But the captives, you and I get the spoils. She's saying that because of Jesus' love for us, he has captured our hearts. And as you look at these men gambling over these garments and to be him exposed naked on a cross, you think how he was taking on our sin. But he took on our sin so that we could be clothed with his righteousness. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our filthy, sinful nakedness, but he sees his son's robe and his son's forgiveness. And out of everything we do as a church, it is essential that we work from that central focus. That a relationship with Jesus does not start with what I do for Jesus. It starts with what Jesus did for me. A relationship with Jesus doesn't start with my loyal love for him, but it starts with his loyal love for me. It doesn't start with my submission to Jesus. It started with Jesus' submission to me because he cared for me. And so as he says, take on this breastplate of righteousness, he's letting us know that I know none of you can live perfectly, but I'm letting you know that I'm forgiving you so that I view you. You are my perfect child, and you are now ready for battle and capable of victory. So when we take of the Lord's Supper this morning, and we look at that piece of bread, the unleavened bread that's there, and we think, man, that, that, what's this? that's an old, stale-looking piece of bread. And when we look at that grape juice and go, man, it looks bad and tastes worse, right? And we go, what, what is the real value of that? Well, the value is in the one who backs those emblems. You see, what good is a piece of paper about two and a half inches wide and four or five inches long? Well, what if there's a $1,000 bill and it's issued by our government? All of a sudden, that which becomes insignificant becomes significant as we take the Lord's Supper this morning. What's the value of unleavened bread and what's the value of a little bit of grape juice? Ah, not that much. Do we understand the one who backs this? And he says, what this represents is my love for you. And it's real. And the fact that you are forgiven because I chose to act for you. And I'm going to continue to act for you. You are my righteous, you are my perfect children, and I love you. So we take this emblem this morning. Let's just think about this reality. The first part of this breastplate of righteousness, the first way that righteousness is used is to describe a gift of God that you don't deserve, that you receive through faith. Would you bow with me? Father, right now as we take of these emblems, Father, I pray our worship team is going to sing a song. Father, that we will understand the significance of your gift and what these represent. Father, they remind us that the breastplate of righteousness was formed by you, that it was formed for us by you because you loved us. And Father, with that, I pray that we will embrace that love and that truth in a way that allows us to embrace the other way that righteousness is used throughout Scripture and that you call us to be righteous in Ephesians chapter 6. Father, again, thank you for your love. Thank you for your allowing us, Father, to stand 
in Ephesians chapter 6, in a few verses that we read of the armor of God, beginning in verse 10 through the end of the chapter, you said your goal of this armor was to make a stand. Not to make a stand and just sing a song, not to just make a stand and raise hands as a show, but to be able to stand against the battle that's going on against us every day as Satan attacks. So, Father, as we understand how loved we are, Father, help us to realize that we have an ally that is greater than our enemy. And as long as we will embrace you, Father, we can always stand, we will always be be protected, and ultimately we'll always be victorious. So, Father, move us to love you, to be grateful for you in a way that allows us to be better for you every day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
The amazing thing about that song, and it is really an amazing song, but it's a very easily misunderstood song. I'd ask these guys, I'd really quite frankly every week to sing it sometime before the lesson or during the lesson. But when it says the basis of that song is that the author is saying, I look at what you have done for me in your grace, and you've made me able to stand before God in judgment and be saved. That's the message of stand to begin with, is God, that you made me stand. I can stand before you without fear. I can stand before you without guilt. I can stand before you without doubt. But it moves beyond that first, and it's the first thing that we're talking about, this righteousness. It's a song about a gratitude for a righteousness that was bestowed, or the opportunity to be righteous was bestowed upon us just because God loved us. But it leads us into the second way that righteousness is used in Scripture. And the second way righteousness is used in Scripture is to describe a way of life that is activated by saving faith. That yes, God in his grace has been good to me and said, I'm going to die for you to give you an opportunity to be saved. And my response is not simply to raise my hands in a song and stand up in a church assembly, but it is to surrender to him completely. In the song, it says there's some, some things that, this, that this, this act of God's grace has done to me. It's caused me to surrender my soul to him. It's caused me to give my heart to him. It's causing me to stand up for him, to use my life to, dis to describe the promise that he gives me. Those are all words within the song. It's saying your grace in making me righteous has made me commit to you to live in a way that displays that righteousness. So while the Bible says that no one can be righteous in the sense of completely perfect all the time. The second way it uses it is to describe someone who is completely and radically committed to being what God wants them to be because they are grateful for what he did and they trust him completely. That's why you read in Scripture, in passages like Genesis 6-9, the Bible says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He walked with God. Is it talking about perfect? No, what he's saying is Noah is a righteous man. He was blameless. Why couldn't you blame him? Did he make mistakes? Yes, but he's human. That's what we do. But he was a man who was committed to walking with God and obeying God. If you come into the New Testament, and there are several passages in the New Testament where the Bible would describe a human being as righteous, not in a sense of perfect and sinless, but in a description of their commitment because of their faith, to being what God wanted them to be. They have a faith that's not like the demons who acknowledge the presence of God or the existence of God, then do what they want. This is a faith that acknowledges who he is and then surrenders their heart and their lives to him. So whenever Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple for the very first time, they run into a prophet named Simeon who is described in Luke 2.25 with these words. The Bible says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was a righteous, and then the dot, dot, dots are, he was a righteous and a devoted man. Devoted to what? Devoted to being what God called him to be, devoted to being obedient. His way of life was a righteous way of life that was activated because he really believed when God said, this is right, it was right. When God said, you can trust me, he really believed it, so he acted out of trust, and it's what the righteousness of God is that we are called to. Now, if you want to do a little study sometimes, go to Ezekiel chapter 8 and read verses 1 through 9, because there's a whole passage that contrasts an unrighteous person and a righteous person. And in Ezekiel, God is saying, listen, there is a sense that you can never be righteous because you can't be purposed. But there's another sense that I can look at your life and go, that's a righteous person, not just because I have forgiven you, but because of the choices that you're making in the way that you're living to glorify me. And both of those types of righteousness are a result. It's really important for us to realize that the second, while it's based in something we do, it is founded in what Jesus did for us. In Romans chapter 10, 10, the Bible says that from the heart, man has faith to get righteousness. That faith is the tool that God brings about to make us right. It has to be within our hearts. It's an understanding of what God did that leads us to live in a way that God would want us to live. 
So that's the way that they're used. This shield in Ephesians chapter 6, this breastplate, I'm sorry, of righteousness, I believe is an amalgam of what Jesus has done for us that gives us both the ability to be forgiven and then what we can do for him, which is empowered by what he did for us. So the question then becomes that we got here is how does the breastplate, how does the breastplate of righteousness protect those who wear it? You go, okay, I understand it's, it's an appreciation, it's the understanding that it's a grace of God and it's a response to God, but how does that protect me from all of the evil attacks? And again, let me remind you in Ephesians 6, over and over again, it says you have an enemy that's against you. And it lets you know that the way that this guy fights this, this force, he's not, he's not a human being. It's a dark power in the heavenly realms, this demonic force, this spiritual war that's going on against you. The primary tool is deception, to lie to you. So it starts that you have to have truth, that you've got to know you've got this, that you've got to be, that you've got to be based in truth. But then after you have that truth, you put on this breastplate of righteousness it protects you in, in a number of ways that are significant. And understanding those ways can help you make sure that you put it on. Because as I've said before, if you don't have this breastplate on, you don't have a chance of winning in your relationship with God. And quite frankly, you don't have much chance of winning in relationships in general. So let's look just at four, and there's any number of ways we could have picked through Scripture, but four ways that the breastplate of righteousness protects me. Number one, the breastplate of righteousness protects me by keeping me humble. When I think of humility growing up, there were words in Scripture that were used to describe Jesus, and I would look at him and go, that doesn't, he doesn't, he's supposed to be God, well, he seems awfully wimpy to me. When the Bible would talk about Jesus being meek. Now, understand, again, Satan twists words to make us misunderstand things. Meek in the original language meant someone who was strong but was under control. If you look at most great wrestlers, most great boxers, most great athletes, it's not only the strong ones that win, but it's the strong ones who can control themselves in the battle. Last night there was a big MMA fight. I was too cheap to purchase it, but somebody told me this morning in one of the big fights, the guy that was winning the fight was disqualified because he got angry and did an illegal kick on purpose, kneed the guy while he was on his knees, kneed him in the face as hard as he could, and was instantly, instantly disqualified. He was strong, but he wasn't meek, and he lost. If he'd have been meek, he would have been strong. When he got angry, he would have controlled himself, and he was ahead on the cards in beating the guy. You see, so when I think meek, I don't think strong, but biblically, the truth is it, it requires strength. You can't be meek without strength. If you're just a beaten down kind of doormat for everybody, you may see yourself as meek, but you're not biblically meek, you're just weak. When it comes to the word humble, I didn't think of somebody who was humble as being strong. I thought somebody who's humble is who could never stand up for themselves, always being, well, you know, they're wrong. And, and, and yet in Scripture, humility is that which brings about strength because it's that which brings about the work of God in our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said this about our... He's talking to a church that, quite frankly, is a messed up church. If you know about their history and you know what's going on, you go, man, these guys, they are, they are really messed up. But it's amazing how many times we can become Christians that we forget that we were messed up. And because we forget, we slide back into being messed up, but we're now messed up and religious. So he says, look carefully at your call, brothers and sisters. By human standards, not many of you are deemed to be wise, not many are considered powerful. Not many of you have come from royalty, right? And the answer would have been a resounding from this church, if they were honest, is right. And quite frankly, the same thing could be said about you and I. Not many of us are, have been deemed wise by human standards. Not many of us were considered powerful. Not many come from royalty. And he says because of that reality, it makes no sense for any person to boast in God's presence. Instead, credit God with your new situation. You're united with the anointing one. He is God's wisdom for us. He is our righteousness and our holiness and redemption. As the scripture says, if someone wants to boast, he should boast in the Lord. Now, when he says boast in the Lord, it's a, 
It's a reference to the fact that we are clothed with Christ. We are inside of Christ. He has this wrap. It's an, a reference to the idea that we are clothed in his powerful army, armor. And sometimes when we start changing our lives and God changes, we begin to think we've got it to, together pretty good. And we begin to think that we put it together. And all of a sudden, rather than being people who are humble, we become people that are arrogant. We become people, rather than being humble and being able to let other people know that the great things are happening in our life because of God, so they can happen in their life, we become arrogant people that nobody wants to listen to or they look at us and go, I can never be like them because I'm messed up. Here's the bottom line. We're all messed up. The question is going to come, are we going to be honest about it, first of all, and then are we going to be honest with who we give the credit to for straightening us up and putting us back together. And Paul says when you're in Christ, there's no reason to boast. It's not about you. You weren't this or that. Don't forget where you came from. There needs to be a spirit of humility. So maybe you drop your head and go, okay, yeah, I know I'm a loser. That's not what God is saying, but there is probably some truth to that we ought to embrace. Yeah, I was. How in the world is having that spirit make me victorious? How does that protect me? Because that seems defeated. Humility is not being defeated. Humility is acknowledging that without Jesus, I could never have won to begin with. And even now. And the amazing thing about humility, when I am humbled, knowing that this is a gift from Christ and he's working in my life that I don't deserve it, I am humble. And when I am humble, God will continue to strengthen me. In James chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, God resists you when you're proud. Now, it's a quote of an Old Testament proverb or a little piece of poetry here. He says, whenever you are arrogant, God resists you. It means he pushes back on you, that he fights against you. I mean, it's a military word for engaging in battle. So whenever I am someone who is arrogant, God goes, no, no, I'm, not, I'm pushing back on that. I'm not going to let you do. And why does he push back? Because he knows that if I'm arrogant, if I'm pride, I'm proud, I'm going to start relying on what I think. So when there's a situation, I'm in a relationship, I'm dating some guy or dating some girl, or I'm in this job or I'm someplace, whenever something happens that I want, I will find a way to justify it because this is, I'm intelligent and I'm, I've got it together. And God says, no, you don't. And I've got to remind you of that. But he says, listen, I'll oppose you if you're proud, but also there's an opposite truth. Hebrew poetry and Proverbs often will make a point by contrast. They'll go, here's this, here's that. God opposes you when you're proud. Oh, I don't want to be opposed by God. But then he says, but God continually pours out grace when you're humble. So it's a multiplied force where you've got, oh, it's bad over here, really bad. God's against me. It's great over here. He's on my side to where he's trying to say, why would you choose something that's really bad when you can have something that's really good? And the really good comes from humility. That God says, listen, when you're humble, when you understand your righteousness was something that I bestowed upon you in my grace when I gave my son on the cross, Whenever that's what you understand, that I can bless you more and more because you will use that awareness to bless others, not just build up your own self-esteem. So whenever I put on the breastplate, it keeps me humble. It's on front of me. It's around my back, and I'm reminded that, man, I didn't fashion this. I didn't purchase this. It was given to me as a gift when Jesus died for me, and it keeps me humble. And in keeping me humble, it keeps me empowered by God. Secondly, the breastplate protects me by keeping me hopeful. Now, again, this is a word in our language that is completely different from the meaning of the word in the original Greek language. When we say hopeful, we think, I hope I win the lottery, which means none of us are going to win it, right, today, because it's, you know, it's just not happening. We know that one in you know, 10 billion, and you can always go, yeah, you can be dumb or dumber, and go, so you're saying there's a chance. Yes, there is, okay? But don't bank on that. It's, it's probably not going to happen. But the word in the original language doesn't mean an iffy, well, somewhere a million in one chance, maybe. It literally, the word hope means confident expectation. And in some of the newer translations and some of the older ones even, the very literal ones, in one translation, it will, tra it will translate the word into hope in the English. And in another translation for the same word, in the same text, it will translate the word confidence 
in the translation. And both of them are absolutely right. So in Hebrews chapter 13, 6, the Bible says, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I'll not be afraid. What can man do to me? I've humbled myself to where I know that I'm not right, but I can be hopeful now because God is working in my life. And I can say it with absolute hope, confident assurance. As I look down at this divinely fashioned piece of armor that is impenetrable by anything that the enemy can throw at me, it can give me confidence. And confidence can play an incredible role in either winning or losing or how well you perform. If you're an athlete, you know what it is when you go out and you're confident. If you play basketball, you go out and you're you know, start a game, you hit your first two shots or three shots, and man, the confidence just begins to flow. You're going, man, I'm on tonight. I'm hot. Pass the ball to me. On the other hand, if you lose confidence, man, you're in trouble. I was never, I always give my grandson Malachi a, a really hard time. Malachi is, is a uh, eighth grader, has a really nice shot and can shoot a long three-pointer. His form is perfect, better than mine ever was. But I used to be a pretty good shooter. But at some point, I lost my confidence. And I can remember going, Why, what is happening here? Before, whenever I was here, I was playing, and I was playing with guys that were better than this, and I was making shots. And now I can remember going up for a layup in a game. And before I started to shoot the layup, thinking, I'm probably going to miss this. Guess what happened? I missed. It wasn't a skill level problem. That's the good thing about a layup. It's really not that much about skill. But it was a confidence problem. For some of you golfers out there that you were really good and then the ball started talking to you, right? You get the yips and you're going, man, what happened? And all of a sudden you lost your swing. Before you lost your swing, you lost your confidence. And whenever I put on the armor of God, I'm humble knowing it's not about me. But what I do know is now that I'm humble, the Lord is my helper. What is any man going to do to me? In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says this, I pray that God will open your minds to see his truth. Then you'll know the hope, that's the word, confidence. One translation says, then you will know the confident expectation that he has chosen us to have. You will know the blessings God has promised his holy people are rich and they're glorious. And you'll know that God's power is very great for those of us who believe. I can be confident because he's promised us great things And he has the power to give us the great things. When I put on the the righteousness of God, the breastplate of righteousness, it is able to protect me. And I can be fully confident because of the death of Jesus brought forgiveness from my past. The resurrection proved that he has the power to empower me, the the power to, to empower me now and in my future. So this this confidence is about a freedom from the past and a power for the future. And every time I look at this breastplate and realize I am clothed, not just in a piece of steel and leather, but in a piece of armor that was divinely fashioned, that is not demolished, but always when worn, demolishes those that come up against it. Man, I can be incredibly hopeful about my future. I can be absolutely confident. Thirdly, the breastplate protects me by keeping me grateful. Gratitude is an incredibly powerful thing in Scripture. If I, 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 somebody asked me one thing, if you could give anything to a new Christian, if you could give them one gift, and there was something that, would, it, that you would say, this is going to ensure that they are going to live for Christ in a way that will allow them to live for him until they die for him and experience salvation eternally, what would it be? Now, there's a lot of things that you may think, okay, well, if I was to give my son, what would I give my son? You just imagine being asked that question. My response to you may be something that surprises you. Because whenever I was asked that question, I said, if I could give any one thing to my son, to my daughter, or to a baby Christian that would make them, that I think that would ensure that they would die living for the Christ the same way that they were when they were born into him, I would give them gratitude for God. It's based upon, that's just a, and I'm not saying your answer was wrong, but here's what that was based upon. And, and sometimes if you get a chance, you want to do in your quiet time a study, go through the Old Testament 
and look at the nation of Israel and any time that they crater or crash and things just suck big time for them, okay? Just write it down, the passage of Scripture, and, just, and you're going to find a lot of those. And then go back and ask and read in the text and go, is, do these people display a gratitude for God or an ingratitude for God? I can tell you what you're going to find. Now, sometimes it won't be evident either, but any times it's evident, and it is evident the vast majority of times, there is a lack of gratitude for God that precedes their defeat and their demise. Then go and look at every time that you see them doing really well and they're being victorious and they're winning and see if they are grateful for God and what you will find that there is gratitude. It shows up. Gratitude in those most of the cases will show up in the signs of sacrifices and praises to God saying we are thankful for what you've done. There is no more, nothing more protective in a person's walk with God than their gratitude for what God has done for them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the writer of the book of Ephesians writes these, these words to the Corinthian church when he said, you see, I am the least of all of his emissaries. Most translations say apostles. The word literally can be translated apostle or emissary. Apostle in scripture just means someone who has been selected and sent out. You see, I am the least of all his emissaries, not fit to be called his emissary because I hunted down and persecuted God's church. Man, I'm, I am the least. I'm not even willing. I'm, I'm not really deserving of being called that, but he calls me that. That's what I am. But I don't deserve it because I hunted down the church. Verse 10, today I am who I am because of God's grace. And I've made sure that that grace he offered me has not been wasted. I work harder, longer, and smarter than all the rest, but I realize it is not me. It's God's grace with me that has made the difference. He says, but I am undeserving to even be saved at all. And he called me into this role of purpose, and he's called me for great stuff. And by the way, he's called you for that too. And he goes, what do I do? It just wells up in me with gratitude that pushes me to live for him, to work for him, to think for him, to act for him. I'm telling you, whenever I see ingratitude in the life of a believer, in the life of a, of, of a kid, Dude, I know that either they're going to come to grips with that or they're going to lose their relationships left and right. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Paul wrote these words. He says, the Messiah's love makes us press on. He doesn't say his love for the Messiah. There's a very, very profound difference. Human love, a relationship that's based upon any human being's love is going to be erratic. Oh, you may think it's going to last. And if you're dating right now, or if you're engaged, you think it's going to last forever. I've got one word that proves the erratic nature of love. One word, marriage. Because you're professing your undying loyalty in that ceremony, and sometimes before the, human, you, the honeymoon is over, you're plotting ways that you can end this person's life so you could part, right? You know, it's like, man, I'm going to kill this person. I just, and it's just an up and down thing. People just expect it to be easy. So if you base, if my relationship and my obedience, if my willingness to live for him is based upon how I'm feeling about him, I'm in trouble because my feelings are so fickle. But you know what's not fickle? The Messiah's love for me. Whenever I was at my worst and could not stand him, he died to make me able to stand with him. Paul says, listen, the Messiah's love makes us press on. He died for all in order that those who live should no longer live for themselves. What is the outstanding characteristic of someone who lives for themselves. They are selfish. What's the characteristic to where we live for someone else? I would say to you, it's not unselfishness, it's gratitude. That they should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised on their behalf. Paul says, listen, if, if, you, want to, if you want to know one of the benefits of wearing this garment, this, this armor that protects you, that you don't deserve to wear, but will lead you victoriously through every battle, be grateful. Because it took the blood of Jesus to put this together for you. So the breastplate protects me by keeping me humble, by keeping me hopeful, by keeping me grateful. And then fourthly, it protects me by keeping me faithful. Because it is, remember we said, it's not only the act of God's grace in my life, it is my response in faith to him. That my faith leads me to faithfulness. 
that his graciousness in my life leads me in gratitude to obey him. In Proverbs eleven six, 6, the Bible says, the righteousness of the, unright, of the upright delivers them. Now, remember we've talked about standing upright is the word you hear in the, in the proverb. You get all these little references, the kind of subtle things that are there. The righteousness of the upright delivers him. What he's talking about here, he says, man, there's going to be situations in this world where you're going to get knocked down. But if you're upright, you're going to be delivered from those blows. You see, whenever I set myself up to do what God wants, I'm setting myself up to be protected. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the unfaithful are trapped by their evil desires. Again, it's that contrast in the proverb, that that way of making something clear. You can be upright and protected, or you can be selfish and be destroyed. You choose. But you don't choose by saying, oh, I'll take A. You choose by saying, I'm going to commit to doing what's right. I've been in ministry long enough to know that when somebody starts choosing to do what they want over what God wants, they're convinced that it's for their benefit. I absolutely know that they've been lied to, and it is going to come crashing down. I've watched it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And if you're in that situation today, I just want you to know the truth is you're not the exception. At some point, you will be the rule. And Satan will allow that to happen whenever he wants that to happen. He'll let you believe the lie to where you're so damaged that he doesn't care if you're lied. You're already damaged. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 6, the Bible says, Live right and you're safe, but sin will destroy you. Satan does everything he can to tell you that that's not the truth. We sin, then we lie to cover it up because somehow we think that the cure is in our image, not in our character, and in our commitment to him. So you see, it protects me in all of those ways. He says, listen, without it, you are instantly and extremely vulnerable. With it, you are absolutely and completely secure. You see, you have eternal security, but it is based upon a promise. It is a promise of eternal security that's based on a premise. That you, there is nothing that Satan can do to destroy you as long as you are walking with God. But if I begin to walk away from God, I am in danger and so are others. So how do I receive the breastplate and all its benefits? How do I, how do I get this thing? You know, how, many, how much money? What are, well, what? Here's the thing. You don't get it by purchasing it. It was purchased so you could get it. And it wasn't purchased with your money. It was purchased with Christ's blood. So I must accept the gift and put it on. I have to clothe myself with Christ. I have to be in Christ. You see all those references? And the question comes, how in the world do I get in Christ? Most churches will tell you that what you do is you bow your head and you say a prayer. The problem with that is that's not what the scriptures, that's not what the apostle Peter says in Acts chapter 2. Whenever he stands up before a group of people who have been prideful in their approach to the Messiah, so much so that they rejected him and crucified him, but as Peter begins to tell the truth, he opens the eyes of many of them, and they are now aware that they have been deceived by Satan, and they have destroyed their Messiah. So they ask Peter, what should we do? They don't know that they're asking, how do we get the breastplate of righteousness? How do we get in Christ? How do we become clothed with Christ? But that's what he tells them. Peter said to them, change your hearts and lives and be baptized. Change your hearts and lives is a one word in Scripture. It's the word repent. It's one word in the Greek language. It means a change of mind that leads to a change of action, a change of heart or mind that leads to a change of action. Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Then God will forgive your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you. It's also for your children, for the people who are far away. It is for everyone the Lord our God calls to himself. Those accepted what Peter said were baptized. On that day, 3,000 people were added to the group of believers. Who are the unbelievers? Those who did not put on Christ. Those who said, no, I don't think I need to do that. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, the Bible says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, baptism is not a human work. It is an act of faith in God. 
You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. How do I get in Christ? Well, Paul says you're baptized into Christ. How do I get clothed with Christ? You're baptized and you're clothed with Christ. Why? Because of your faith in his grace. So if you have never surrendered your life in faith, and by the way, baptism is, in Scripture is not just a dunk in water. It is an absolute surrender of trust to Jesus. Baptism is that place to where I say and I embrace the truth that I do not trust me to run my life. I trust Jesus to run the life, my life. He is my Lord and Savior. So if you want to get this breastplate, this act of grace, I accept the gift and put it on. But secondly, I must affirm the gift and keep it on. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, and i got to hurry here, in a, in a tense to where, again, he writes in a, in a past tense where he says, having buckled up the truth in the original language and having the breastplate of righteousness. But yet he's reminded them, I believe, because they're letting those things slip in a way that could endanger them and others. And there has to be an affirmation of our faith that's in our heart, and there will be if it's a saving faith. In James chapter 2, the Bible says there's that a demonic faith acknowledges the existence of God and does not allow that faith to affect their behavior, where a divine faith always acknowledges the existence of God, but not just with words, but with obedience. So I affirm that gift. That yes, it's a gift from God, but I am not just going to wear the gift of grace and do what I want, but I'm going to affirm it by living for him. I read a study this week that was published on belief.net. It was from a survey that was reported in the Huffington Post. And in this survey, they took a group of about 1,300 men and women from all different backgrounds between 18 and 65. And on these surveys, they asked them to describe their religious nature. Are you absolutely not religious to very religious? Then they asked them to describe themselves politically. Are you very conservative, very liberal? And they responded that. Then, then they asked them to chronicle the things that they had done right and the things that they had done wrong in the past few weeks that they could remember, just to make a list. And then every day they got a text that asked them for that day to go, what did you do today that was wrong? What did you do today that was right? When the study was over, the survey and the, the study revealed that there was no distinguishable difference at all in the behavior of the politically conservative and the politically liberal. Both of them had almost identical acts that they described as wrong, and they had identical acts of things that they did that were charitable or good and right. That didn't really surprise me. The alarming thing is, is that in this study, those who claim to be very religious and those who claim to have no religion at all had no difference at all in the number of acts that they did that were wrong or the number of acts that they did that was right. And so the conclusion that the people who did the survey was is that religious, being religious does not ensure in any way right behavior. And I guess that's true if we can say that we're talking about religion. In Scripture, being a follower of Jesus is first and foremost about a relationship with God and not simply a relationship with God from the heart, not just a connection to a religion because of your head. Many of us, we're not, we, we go, what are you religious? I'm this, why? Because that's what my parents were. You just know what they were, and so there's some affinity, some associations there. But in Scripture, a relationship with Jesus is something from the heart. And without a relationship with Jesus in our heart, then it's impossible to have a right relationship that shows up in the way that we live. And the reason why so many of us struggle, why isn't there a greater difference? Because we have a lot of religious people, but not a people in a relationship with Jesus as Lord and Savior. And one of the things that I hope is that this church, there is always going to be a clear difference in how we behave because of what we believe of how we love because of who we loved and how we were loved by him. 
You see, it's a matter of having a relationship with Jesus. It's not because your parents made you. It's not because you're part of the youth group. I, I hope you love your youth group. I hope you love the activity. I hope you love the campus ministry. I hope you love the Crossings Church. But all of that is worthless unless you love Jesus in a way that changes your life. You see, that's why the truth of how this relationship is makes wearing the breastplate, the heart protector, even more vital. In Ephesians 4.1, Paul writes to these guys. He says, listen, you guys, I urge you. I'm a prisoner because, of, because I serve the Lord. You know what I think he's saying there? A bunch of you are whining about how hard you have it, and you're not living for Jesus and you're blaming him. Oh, if everything was better, I'd live for him more. If everything was easy, I'd live for him more. I urge you, I who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Remember how committed you were when you, were, when you made that commitment? Remember what Paul says in Romans 6 as he pictures those people's baptism? He says, didn't you say that you were going to die to yourself and live for him, that you were not going to live for, for your own? Can I just encourage you guys, live like that again. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says these words, so I tell you this. And insist on in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And then he talks about their way of life. He goes, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We believe the truth and we were changed and somewhere we stopped believing and we're being changed in a way that's not good. You see, we've got to have a body of believers that are becoming like Jesus because you see there are younger people that are looking and what you do forms the norm for them. If this is a church where people come in, they're excited in the beginning and they're all out and they sacrifice and they love and they care and they give, but the older they get, the less they're like that, then what you're teaching our baby Christians is this is a place to come and live for a while and die for a long time. And in doing that, Satan has fed us a lie and we lose. Paul said it like this in Romans chapter 6, verse 11 and 13. A church that was struggling with sinning and just going, okay, God's grace will cover me. I'm wearing this armor because it's from the grace of God. And Paul writes and goes, hold it, yes, you are buying by the grace of God. But if you're going to be talk about the grace of God, how about you talk about it appropriately? Because the grace of God was never designed to cause you to sin. God forbid, he says in Romans chapter 5, the last verse. Then in chapter 6, he says this pointing them to their baptism and calling back to that initial commitment. He says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do not let sin reign. Don't let sin be your boss. Don't let it reign so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body as to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. Why? Because of his grace. Be righteous in your behavior because of the grace of God that put you that in the status. Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. I want to encourage you to put on the armor of God this morning. Inside your bulletin this morning, there's one final piece of paper I want you to look at. And that's a commitment card, a communication card. Either one, you go, I'm afraid of commitment. Well, many are. Communication card isn't very scary except for the men, all right? That's, we're, we're afraid of communication. But God wants to communicate with you to get you to commit, okay? Would you please, as I bow my head and begin to pray, will every one of you, man, woman, and child, pull that out and allow me to lead you through that card as we close this morning? Father, I thank you for your grace. I know I'm not deserving of any of the blessings you give me, but, Father, you gave them to me because I had a deep love, and, Father, in a sense, you knew that I could be so much better than I thought I could ever be. Father, I pray that that grace to me will not be without effect, but I'll be like the Apostle Paul, and I really work hard to participate in that transformation progress process. Father, maybe there are people here today that don't know you and they don't know if you exist. They don't know if you're good. They don't know anything at all. But God, I pray that you'll, uh, you'll help them to know 
that you are here for them and you love them. And the way that you let them know that, that you're worthy of your trust, you say, is through studying the Bible. Not just through studying the Bible, but having someone share it with you. You said in Romans 10 that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard when someone shares that. I believe in God. I don't know if I believe God is good. I don't know if I've ever really been a Christian. I don't know, and Father, those answers are found in who you are and what it means to trust you. And they can just check, I'd like to, a Bible study, a personal Bible study. For others, I know there are people here today, they don't need to study the Bible anymore. They're, their knowledge is far outperforming their application. Got lots of facts, but they've never surrendered to you. They know a lot about you, but they know also they don't want to let you reign in their life. They want to be in control. Father, it's a sad place to be, and you don't want them to be there. So, Father, if there are people here that have just said, no, I don't want to be, I, I want to do what I want, help them to know the foolishness and how they have been deceived, that the truth is in this life and eternal life that you bring the abundant life. All of us have problems, but only yours make it through those problems, Father, to be better. So if there's people here who have just got at that baptism study and said, no, I'm not going to be baptized because I want to be a free agent. There are no free agents. There are servants of Satan. There are servants of God. And I pray that they'll make the choice to be your servant. Maybe for others, there are people that have just been wounded. They had wrong things done to them, even by people who claim to be doing what's right. And Father, I pray that, you know, for those of us who have been through abuse, the natural thing that we do is we, because of somebody else ignoring your truth, we refuse to embrace your truth. I know it's a satanic lie. Father, I don't know about the people who have been abused, but I know whoever abused them ignored what you said and hurt them. And God, I pray that they won't respond in kind and ignore you and hurt themselves further. Father, if they've been abused, if they went through an abortion, if they went through a divorce, if they're so angry, over to my right, there's a table that's set up featuring our anger management booth, and they can go visit that afterwards. And I pray that people will because, and just share it with, because anger was such an issue for me, and it blows up. And Father, often I would blow up and then I'd be fine, but the shrapnel had killed people that I cared about. So Father, again, just I pray that we know that we can get help. I don't know what we need to do, but I, Father, I know we need your breastplate of righteousness. We need to receive it by grace. We need to wear it in faith, Father, and if we do, we're promised to be victorious. So move us to right, then to drop the card in the baskets as we leave. For our members, we need their card and their contribution. For our guests, we ask them not to give money, but to really give you a chance. And we do it in the name of Jesus. Amen.